Dom, let's talk about Josephus. There's so much we could be said. He's written a lot. And of course, through Josephus, interpretations run rampant. So in your book, Render Unto Caesar, highly recommend it. Got to get a copy. You want to take a deep dive into Josephus, and he kind of does flip-floppity stuff, weird things. So I'm going to let you explore Josephus for us. Okay. And I'm just here as a student listener. All right. One back up. When I first read Josephus' Jewish War, this would be in the 50s as a student, what struck me immediately, I'm reading Irish history. Everything that the Irish had done, nonviolent, violent, terrorists against the British in the 18th centuries, in the 1800s, I meant, the 19th century, they were there, which, which made me, you know, okay, I, I, I recognize this world. It's the world of a small colony taking on a great empire and probably going to be crushed in the process. But anyway, um, let me say why I got into Josephus. After I got into the book, the second and third section, we have two absolutely different ideas of how to, to acculturate to Rome. It's absolutely diabolical as far as revelation. It's canonized almost in Luke Acts. Now, I wanted to get to Jesus. But it seemed, it seemed silly after I'd been in the New Testament and they showed totally different. What's the point going in and finding a third one in John's Gospel or Paul? Somebody's going to say, well, they're all making it up, so forget it. So I said, okay, as a tactical maneuver, let me go outside the New Testament completely and try and find out what a Jewish author like Josephus has to say, if anything, about Jesus. Then we'll get to the Gospel. But let's start with Josephus. So that was the tactic. Now, it was not because I think Josephus is better than the gospel. But immediately when you're using Josephus, if you're using him critically, as you should, of course, you're trying to understand him. That's what I meant critically. Josephus says, for example, clearly, God has given power to the Roman Empire. Verbatim, I quote him. Do not rebel against the Roman Empire in any way, shape, or form, are you rebelling against God? Furthermore, the rule of the Roman Empire has been given to the Flavian dynasty, the new dynasty after the Julio Claudians ended from Augustus to um, Nero, and now all of a sudden we've got um, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. The new one has arrived, and God says Josephus has not only given part to Rome, but Roman part to the Flavians. And furthermore, he comes up with this. It makes me gasp. We used to believe that somebody from our land would become the ruler of the world. This is the way he defines the Messiah. We now know that was Vespasian, who was on our land, from our land as conqueror when he went to Rome to become emperor. It's a breathtaking piece of impertinence. I don't think the Jewish tradition can ever forgive him for that one. Vespasian is the Messiah. Okay. That's Josephus. Now, twice, Jose well, Josephus mentions John the Baptist, he mentions Jesus of Nazareth, and he mentions James, the brother of Jesus, James the Good, who is um, executed in 62. Those are the only, but he never mentions Peter or Paul, by the way. You wouldn't know they existed if you just had Josephus. But he does mention Jesus twice. And there is a discussion whether his first mention of Jesus, that's the longer one in the, the beginning of the Jewish war, I think it's book 18, whether that has been a complete Christian interpolation. It's been debated. Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. Some people think it has been slightly tampered with. I think slightly tampered with is the more accurate one because basically the idea that there was a Jesus he started a movement, he was executed to end the movement, but the movement continued is exactly the same for things that Tacitus says, for example. That's, that's the Roman story about who these weirdo Christians are. They're followers of this Christ who had the movement over there in Judea, we crucified him and didn't work, the movement continued. That, that's the basic thing the Roman elites knew about Christianity, say, around the year 100. I don't want to detour you, but there are people who want to say that they think it's authentic, the whole thing. 
and they want to say that maybe Josephus himself actually agreed with it or something. If, if somebody wants to say it's authentic, I'm not going to argue, but you notice what we end up doing all the time. Let's have the argument about whether it's wholly authentic, partially authentic. So, no, could we talk about the content first? <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm not debating with you, but no, no, no. I, I notice that so many of these discussions, you make up your mind about it, but then uh, even if you wipe out that first mention, let's go to um, what's the chapter 20? 20. Uh, I think 200, where he's not talking about Jesus at all. He's talking about James the Just, Jesus' elder brother, as uh, maybe his older brother. Um, and to explain who he is, he says he's the brother of Jesus called the Christ. Called the Christ. Or nicknamed the Christ, if you will. So that would make me think we kind of are supposed to know who this is. He has to explain it because I don't know, there's a dozen Jesuses of that name in Josephus. So he has to say, what Jesus? But he says the Christ. He, he doesn't say um, the brother of Jesus. Jesus called the Christ. I, I would expect him, by the way, I'm surprised he doesn't say G um, the brother of Jesus, whom I talked about earlier, because he tends to do that quite a lot and refer back to himself. He doesn't refer back to it, but he says Jesus the Christ. So I have these two things in Jesus. The first one is explaining who Christians are. That's all he wants to do, and they're followers of this guy, Christ. But now he's done something. He has already said that Vespasian is the Messiah. He doesn't use that term, but he says he's supposed to be the king of the world. That's a Greek word for the Messiah. And Jesus is the Christ. So well, now we've got two messiahs. I don't know if Josephus is aware of this, but he set up a problem. He has just omitted Jesus was the Messiah. So in the light of that, I am inclined to take at least whatever amount you want to take of that story as authentic. And there's the deep background to this, that in Jewish tradition did not preserve Josephus. They preferred to forget all of that first century, <laughs> those wars that almost destroyed their homeland and their temple and everything else. Not even talk about that. Let's talk about, you know, Jewish holiness. So if Josephus had not been preserved by Christians, we wouldn't have Josephus. We just wouldn't. There's no, no Jewish text of Josephus. So around the year 1200 in round numbers, there was a great interest in Latin translations of Josephus, Latins. And they always put them in the manuscripts, they put them in the order, Josephus, Jewish antiquities, Jewish war, even though that's the reverse of how they're written. Because here's what they're thinking. We over here have the Christian Old Testament and the Christian New Testament. Here we have a Jew, Jewish author who has the antiquities of the Jews kind of parallel to our own testament and corroborating it. And then we have the Jewish war corroborates. This is where it can turn nasty. See, they crucified our Jesus. Look what happened to Jerusalem. Uh, that what Jesus. So they were using Josephus as a, as a valid, validation of their own Bible. They had a vested interest in not tampering too much. So if I were to throw the, the argument anyway, I would throw it towards non-tampering. Because otherwise they destroy their own point. And all of these Latin texts, there's, there's a huge industry in creating Latin texts. Why would they do that? And then French translations. That's why the French the, the National Library in Paris has some of the best of them. And it's also very nice to make them available on the web. Because they wanted Josephus as corroboration for the whole Christian Bible. So they have a vested interest in non-tampering. If I had to vote absolutely, all or nothing, <laughs> it's either all in or all out, I'd go with all in. It, it could be Josephus is very careful not to offend people if he doesn't have to offend them. If there's a lot of powerful Jewish Christians in Rome when he's writing, he's not going to offend them. He won't be as scornful as Tacitus is 
by saying that Christianity is an infection, an infection spread, no great problem. It's just an infection. It's just something rotten. Everything rotten says that just comes to Rome eventually. No, I, I think there's a vested interest in Christians not tampering with Josephus because it corroborates their Bible. And they can use it as collaboration. Corroboration, I meant, sorry. So Josephus, you go even further in your book and showing you're using Josephus to show these militant and uh, non-militant that we've discussed in previous episodes. But how <clears throat> Josephus, how you talk about the Christians here in the 1200s are flipping the order. But in reality, each of those books is actually doing something different to a different audience. Yes. One speaking to the Romans as if he's anti-Jewish almost, yes, yes. Uh, pro-Roman. I won't go so far to say anti-Jewish, but in some respects, yeah. he's definitely trying to tone it down. And then the others, antiquities, he's pro-Jewish and anti-Roman. Yeah. If, if you want it to be a little oversimplified, the Jewish war is written to defend Romans to Jews. And the Jewish antiquities is to defend Jews to Romans. That's a little bit oversimplified, but, but the Greeks do. But yes, that's the way it is. I mean, he's, he is walking a tightrope. He gives seven, seven volumes to the Romans, but 20 to the Jews. So, and then contra Appian, against Appian, of course, defends it to the sneering Greeks. So, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say thank God for Josephus. Thank God we've got him. It would be a, a, a giant hole in the first century. But let me draw it, um, attention to something. I think in the first century, as far as I can see, now we're not talking about Jesus, Jewish tradition invented something called nonviolent resistance. At least I don't know, and I'm, that's not a rhetorical question, I don't know anywhere it is as a massive organized principle before the first century. Individuals, of course, could do nonviolent resistance, but as, a, as an organized principle, after the War of Four, whenever there was an armed rebellion, a violent rebellion, the Either the Syrian legions would come south with fire and brimstone to teach you people a lesson, as it were, so we won't have to come back again soon, or the Egyptian legions would come up. There were no legions in the Jewish homeland, but they were on each border. So 4 BC, rebellions at the death of Herod the Great all over the Jewish homeland. Legions came south, crucified 2,000 of the leaders in Jerusalem. 6 CE, when the census was put in, when Archelaus was dumped out and a Roman governor came in to Samaria, Judea, and Edomea, and the tax came in and the census for taxation, there was a non-violent rebellion. The reason I know it was non-violent is, first of all, the legions didn't march. Police action could stop this. But in that period between six, sorry, between 4 BCE and 66, 70 years, there was massive organized nonviolent resistance experiments, including probably John the Baptist, by the way. It's all in Josephus, but Josephus, remember, is totally against any opposition to Rome, any opposition. In fact, he's a bit more tolerant of rebellion against Rome because that, that happens, you know, rebellions happen. Rome puts them down, shouldn't do it, but it happens. He describes the non-violent rebellion people, non-violent resistance, let's say, as having purer hands, because there's no blood on it, but impurer hearts, because they're devious. They're using non-violent resistance. And Rome isn't, Rome is geared to send the legions. That's, that's what they're sitting there for. <laughs> they're in their camps out of Antioch waiting to go out. That's their job. But non, what do you do with nonviolent resistance? If a whole massive crowd sits down outside Caesarea Philippi and tells Pilate we won't move until you do X, what's he going to do? Attack them? Die as martyrs? So nonviolent resistance backed by martyrdom if unfortunately necessary, is invented, as far as I can see, in the Jewish tradition in that 70-year period. And when we talk about the non-violent Jesus, we are absolutely not saying he invented it. 
He's programming his vision of God's rule on earth being present into that nonviolent experimentation, as John the Baptist is, by the way, as well. That's why Pilate will execute Jesus, but not round up his followers. Antipas will execute John, but not round up his followers. Hmm. There's so much here. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some type of foundation for what, what we call martyrdom. There, there's a foundation for dying for just causes yeah. as a hero, things like that. But what you're specifically uniquely describing, you're saying, is a program that is developed at this time. I think that's a really interesting thing to think about because when I was reading uh, Ken, Canada's uh, Moss's work, yeah. uh, The Myth of Persecution, um, she also came on and did an episode. She was pointing out like the, fr the framework's there, but monopolized the word martyrdom comes yeah. by Christians a little later, yeah. she said. Um, and it may, it may stem from the fact that there's this unique program. It makes me want to ask if Jesus really wanted to die. Okay. Because if he is, I mean, I, yeah. I'd love to get your personal yeah. thought on that. Be before we talk about Jesus, yeah. let, let me go back. Please. Go back to what we were talking about, Josephus. Um, for example, when Caligula tries to put his statue into the temple, and Petronius takes two legions, <laughs> they know the trouble, with the statue coming south. And Joseph, uh, Petronius, being a good aristocrat, governor of Syria, stalls like mad, risks his own life, because he knows this, was, this would have started the year, the war of 66 in, in the winter of 41. So they go out, Philo and Josephus tells them, when men, women, and children sit down and say, we're not moving because if you destroy our temple, desecrate our temple, ruin the traditions of our parents, we might as well die. They tell him, I mean, you can read the, the text in Josephus and in Philo, they're inviting martyrdom. Now, I don't know what would have happened if Petronius had turned the legions on them. I don't know. Would they have fled? Would they have taken up stones? I don't know what would have happened if Caligula hadn't been assassinated and Petronius escaped death by dis because of disobedience. To but they did this. So that's martyrdom, and it's in the Jewish tradition. Now, when you turn to the, um, the Roman tradition and Christians, it is absolutely true that there is no imperial program or practice of martyrdom until about the year 250. That doesn't mean there isn't, as I said before, I think, nasty local programs. Of course, these people don't fit in, they're different. That could happen. But there's not massive martyrdom. Now, of course, one martyr <laughs> is enough if the, how would I put, if the movement can be based on it. As we well know, it only takes one person to be claimed to be a martyr, and you're a martyr if you're killed for, for your faith, as a Jew or a Christian. Of course, to make a mystique of martyrdom. Of course, I, there was no imperial such one. But somebody like Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote, writes seven letters, he's trying to outdo Paul, almost seven letters as he travels across Asia Minor towards martyrdom in Rome. Of course, that's going to be huge. That's why he's writing the letters to all of these churches. He is making himself a program. But it doesn't mean for a second that the whole Roman Empire is programmatically after Christians. I think what happens, by the way, say at Antioch, the reason they send somebody like him to Rome, he's a troublemaker. He might be an important troublemaker with important people on either side. The governor does exactly what the smart governor would do, off to Rome. It's not because he's committed a crime so egregious that he has to go to Rome. The governor probably doesn't want to get involved in executing him. Somebody's gonna be mad at him. Send him to Rome, and years from now, the word will come back that he was executed, but, you know, I didn't do it. So when somebody is sent to Rome for execution, don't think this means they have done the worst thing we could imagine. It could be the local governor just doesn't want to get involved, and if there's a huge dispute going on with important sponsors on both sides, easiest thing to do is send it somewhere else. Send it to the feds, as it were. Don't, don't get involved locally. Make the feds make the decision. So it's true that there is no giant persecution. But then the real question, 
that point becomes <laughs> why does Revelation say there is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. I wonder, what are your thoughts? Do you think Jesus, uh, hearing a couple different models of this, do you think Jesus purposefully knew he was going to die? Or do you think it was more of a cognitive dissonance, anachronism to put on the movement where Jesus gets killed? He didn't expect this to happen. He gets killed. And the the followers, being biblicist, are reading in the tradition and they're finding what well, this can't be the end. Because yeah. this gets into the question I hope we can get into is why the movement survived. Yeah. If the movement, if cognitive dissonance is the answer, yeah. then the explanation is they're searching the scriptures and they're finding yeah. their reasons in prophecy and scripture and tradition rather than in the reality. Where do you stand on the issue? Do you think Jesus was, in a sense, maybe this is a bad term, but kind of suicidal? Or do you yeah. think this guy didn't expect what happened and it happened and it was such a shell shocker that his his no. followers are biblical. What do you think happened? Once again, I'm going back to the text to see. I'm not going to psycho babble about Jesus's. Here's what we got. John the ba Baptist was executed. Did John the Baptist know he was doing something dangerous? Of course he did. Any massive movement in the Roman Empire, anything that they would have called sedition, of course he wasn't. He wasn't militant, he wasn't armed, he wasn't violent. That's got nothing to do with it. He is attracting a lot of attention. He's starting a movement. What Antipas did is exactly what he did. Take him as far away from his constituency as you can, as far south to Machaerus, to his back, and get rid of him with nobody's around. Exactly. However it's done, it makes sense. It makes absolute sense. And it makes equal sense that people remember John the Baptist long after. So when Antipas loses the war with Aretas IV of, of Nabatea, they say, ah, God got you for killing John, even maybe <laughs> 10 years later. How many times does that happen today I when know, a politician <laughs> dies? They go, ha ha, you sinner. God, anyway. God tends to be a little slow. It took 10 years, you know, <laughs> to take it out. And out. Anyway, um, so basically now Jesus knows, of course. This is dangerous stuff. If he doesn't know, I'm, I'm afraid he's been very, very unwise. Right. Yeah. Now, he knows it's dangerous. If I could use an analogy, Martin Luther King Jr. knew it was dangerous. Knew if I go there, it's dangerous. If I go there, it's dangerous. Do you go there to get killed? Well, let's look at what happens. People seem to think Jesus went up every year to the Passover, or regularly. He did not. A day labor in Galilee, that would be two, day, two weeks at least, minimal, off work. And you'd have to have enough money for your sacrifice when you got there. I don't know if Jesus went up ever. And yeah, I know what Luke says. I, I know. Everyone went up every year. That's Luke. Um, I know Jesus went up to Jerusalem once. I'm certain of that. And I know he got killed. Yeah. Okay? So I'm trying to ask, why did he go up this time? Was he looking to get himself killed? Uh, first of all, I would say, he know what happened to John the Baptist. I don't know he'd have to leave Antipas' territory to get himself killed. I think the only reason Antipas did not move against Jesus is he was prorating the death of a popular prophet. I'm not going to go after Jesus until they've cooled down a bit on John the Baptist. But Antipas would have got Jesus eventually if he stayed in Galilee. Now, he goes to Jerusalem. Again, I read Mark's text as the earliest of the gospel. And I don't do that and say, oh, whatever he said must be true. But I have to explain, if he was executed, what happened before? What got him executed? Did he go up to get himself killed? And as I said, why would he have to go all the way? Antipas would have helped. If you said he did it, watch what he's doing. Read Mark. It's the only thing we got. Every night he goes out to Bethany. He doesn't live in the city. Now, there might be a full moon, Passover and everything, but you don't stay in the city if that's where your enemies are. Get out of the city every night to Bethany. I imagine uh, what I think happened, people like Martha, Mary, Lazarus, probably relatives, by the way, had said to Jesus, if you're serious about this God's rule on earth, they might have said this if they were a little bit on Greece. Get out of those dumps up there in Galilee. Come to a real city. Come down here to Jerusalem at Passover. People from all over the world, Jewish, come out and bring your message down here. We're ready for you. We have followers down here who know about you. Bring it here and we 
can protect you. Because when you come here, by day, we will protect you in the temple. Yeah, you have to watch the priests. They'll be after you because this is dangerous. Sedition during Passover is, is dynamite. They would have known, for example, there was a huge um, riot in what was it in 6 CE with all of these people compressed in the courts of the temple, if anyone even said anything about, say, the Roman soldiers, or the legion, not legions, but Roman soldiers up there in the Antonium, they could start a riot and people would be trampled. So zero toleration. Don't worry, we'll protect you in there. The crowd is with you. They'll greet you. And at night, you'll be safe because you'll get out. Everything I read in Mark that helps me understand why it takes Jesus, why, why he isn't killed on, on what we call Palm Sunday. Why by Palm Sunday evening, if Jesus wants to get killed, isn't Pilate, who's already in Jerusalem with extra forces because of Passover, willing to oblige? And the next day in the temple. And the next day in the temple. Why does it take so long? Because I think what happened. Now, Mark says he was betrayed by Judas. I, I've gone backwards and forwards on that, but I, I wouldn't, at the most, it's like maybe 51%. It's such a cliche. You know, you're, you're betrayed by your insider. I mean, it happens all the time, but like, yeah. either way. So Go people ahead. can argue it, you know, it happens. I would say by about Wednesday or Thursday, I'm Caiaphas, let's say. I've been watching every night. He goes out of the tomb. He crosses the Kedron Valley, goes around the Mount of Olives to Bethany. Hmm. I could get raided. If I'm down there in the middle around where we say that my, the Garden of Gethsemane is, if I am there with my soldiers, before he makes the, the decision to go around the, the, the Mount of Olives to the, to the west or to the east, I grab him there. I get him. It'll be nighttime. Nobody know. He'll be away from his defensive screen. And I can get this all done and get the Romans, get rid of them before anyone knows about it. They're all busy with Passover. They won't know till it's too late. So we have to forget that the whole world is watching. Jesus is up on the top of a hill. No. I think he goes to Jerusalem to bring his message there. He has a good chance of getting away with it. He always, almost does. He doesn't. But he's crucified. He doesn't do it to get himself crucified because he's doing all the wrong things. Thank you.